Uh, so stink bug pests are essentially, there's over 300 species in North America, and we had all that really fun uh, waiting music before the seminar started. So now we go from the happy seminar uh, holding music to insects that are destroying our crops. So uh, we'll go with that. So a stink bug uh, is essentially a, a true bug. So a true bug is an insect that has this piercing sucking mouth part. We can see it uh, here on the bottom left of the screen. So all stink bugs have that. They have piercing sucking mouth parts, just like some of our aphids uh, and other insects that pierce through plant structures and feed on our plants. So stink bugs are in the insect family Pentatomidae. Uh, so again, if we, go, if we go to the top here and we look at the classification of all living things, uh, we're going down into this family level here, which below that is the genus and species. So we're gonna talk about the entire family today and we're going to discuss some of the different species that we commonly see uh, in the mountain west states. So most stink bugs are herbivores, but not all of them. So uh, a lot of the pests are all of the pests that we think of, these are herbivores, but we do have some predatory ones like here on the, the right here, which is called a two spotted stink bug, even though there's not really any spots that are seen on it. Uh, but most of them are herbivores, uh, but there are some beneficial stink bugs that are also actively in our crops. They're helping to control some of the pest stink bugs. Then we have some damage here too, which we will look at some uh, more pictures of damage uh, later down, later along in the seminar. Uh, however, we have these like corky lesions, which they can cause this damage on most crops. But again, we'll have some more pictures of that later on. So the stink bug has, is essentially a hemimetabolous insect or one that does not go through complete metamorphosis. So stink bugs essentially have nymphal stages. Uh, they, most of them have five nymphal stages that look somewhat like the adult stage. And they just go from this egg stage early in the year uh, and there are some that you know, lay eggs throughout the year. And they go through these sort of small spider-like stages. A lot of people think that they look like spiders when they're really young. And then by the time they're adults, they have fully formed wings uh, like these adults do here in this picture. So uh, different species of stink bugs are going to have different life stages occurring at different parts of the year. So this isn't something that we can typically look and think, oh, you know, we're seeing this, this life stage at this part of the year, it must be this species. Some of them have, you know, different generations or multiple generations per year. So uh, you just kind of want to get into your head what a lot of these nymphal stages look like. They look like small spiders sometimes, uh, and then they don't have fully formed wings. This one, for example, has little wing buds on them. Uh, and then once they become an adult, they'll have a fully formed wing like these guys on the right here. So we look at the basic anatomy of the stink bug. Uh, there are a couple things that we really want to pay attention to. And I mentioned earlier that this is in the insect family Pentatomidae. Uh, so there's a couple ways that you can use that family name to benefit you. Uh, one of the ones that I actually prefer, but it actually isn't the main reason why it's called the family Pentatomidae, is because they're almost perfectly shield shaped. So if we look at this adult stink bug here, it really has five main sides to it that kind of forms a perfect little shield shape. Uh, you can use that most of the time to identify stink bugs uh, and some relatives. Uh, but unfortunately, so there are some relatives that do also have sort of a shield shape with five sides, but a lot of the other related families tend to be a little bit longer. So think of a stink bug as a almost a perfect shield shape with five general sides on it. But the reason that they're actually called Pentatomidae or why they're actually in that family is because their antenna are five segmented. Uh, this can be really hard to see in the field, so you don't necessarily have to use that feature but if you do have a magnifying glass or a loop, you can count the antennal segments and they will have five antennal segments uh, like this one here. So we have this first little tiny one that can sometimes be hard to see, and then four that are quite long and extend out from the head. So some of the features here on the left are the features that you're going to want to use to identify stink bugs. Uh, most of the ones that we'll be discussing today, you can use a couple of larger features like this, a large part on the top here. This is called the pronotum. So it's just behind the head, and it's also attached to everything down here, which is the, the abdomen. And we're also going to use this whole area called the convexium. So this is essentially the, the wings, and uh, it's also un, in that same general area, is the border of the abdomen here that can sometimes be included. Uh, all stink bugs are going to have this wing membrane here, which is a really helpful identification feature. So you can see the body underneath uh, the wings essentially through this little membranous part of the wing. Uh, sometimes you can also use this little area. It kind of looks like a, the end of a shovel almost. Uh, this is called the scutellum, which is also a helpful ID feature in many cases. Uh, 
So I'm just going to go through some of the common species that we see in the Mountain West. Uh, a lot of these are based off of what we find in Utah, but if you're tuning in from Montana or Nevada or anywhere else nearby, a lot of the species are gonna be the same and they're gonna look relatively similar. Uh, so I'll just go through a lot of the common ones and then uh, give you guys a resource that you can access online to look at some of the other common stink bugs that we find in the area. But I'm essentially going to be covering the really common ones that we tend to see all the time. Uh, again, this can probably be modified a little bit depending on your exact location, but in general, these ones are going to be really common. So the first one that was on the last slide, uh, and we use that one to look at general features because it's a really big species and it's really easy to find all the body parts on it. Uh, so this is called the green stink bug or Kynavia hilaris. So this one's really easy to identify because it tends to be kind of large. Uh, some of them get to about a half inch, maybe even a little bit longer. Uh, and they're completely green throughout. So this is a really easy one to identify. Uh, sometimes you will get these uh, orange to red to yellow striping on the outside of the abdomen, but that's not always present. Uh, one of the issues with stink bugs is that all the life stages tend to look quite different. So we have the egg stage here that is a light green color. Sometimes they're actually really yellow. Uh, so it's hard to identify eggs. That's just a general rule of thumb. And we're not gonna go into too many identification features for the nymphs, which we can see here, uh, because the nymphs look different in pretty much every species. And as they grow, they will look different each time they molt into a new instar as they get closer to becoming an adult. Uh, once they get close to becoming an adult, so this is a fifth instar here, uh, then they start to look a little bit more like the adults. They have the orange border here in this one. And you can kind of see that so those wing buds coming out and this one is almost solid green. In the resource that I'll give you at the end of all the identification related things, uh, there will be some pictures to nymphs and you can use that guide to help you identify a lot more of the nymphs that are around. Uh, so green stink bug is an occasional fruit crop pest and it's also a grain pest. Uh, fruit crops would certainly be the main concern out here in the Mountain West, uh, but it is occasional. We find a lot of them, uh, but they aren't really in dense enough populations to cause damage, but definitely be uh, on the lookout for them because they do eat a lot of different crops. So the next one can look a little bit similar sometimes to the green stink bug, uh, but there are a couple of uh, good identification features that we can use. Uh, so this is the conchuela bug, so chlorocroa legata. Uh, this can either be solid green, like this one here in the middle, or it can be solid black, like this one here on the right. Uh, these can sometimes be, you know, the black one is very easy because it doesn't really look like a lot of the other stink bugs that we see, but this green one in the middle can look somewhat like the green stink bug. Uh, so the way that we identify conchuela bug versus the green stink bug is this one has a pale border that is pretty thick uh, and the the black version or the black morph also has that completely uh, pale border that goes all the way around the stink bug uh, so use that to your advantage if you see a green stink bug that is completely surrounded by a pale border odds are you're looking at a conchuela bug or, or potentially the one that we'll look at in the next slide too uh, so the eggs of this one, I think I actually see the eggs more often than I do the adult or the nymph virgins. Uh, so they're kind of this, this cool pale white color and they have this cool little circles or cool little circles that full, form on the top of the eggs. Uh, so these eggs are kind of easy to identify because there's not a lot that look quite similar to these. Uh, and then the nymphs of these, I would say that we, you probably won't find a lot of the nymphs unless there's a really heavy infestation. Uh, and that is likewise to most stink bugs. You don't really see a ton of the nymphs. And this one also, likewise to the green stink bug, is just an occasional fruit crop pest. Uh, we do get these a lot in peach orchards here in Utah, but they're not really at high abundances. Uh, we just get them sort of steadily throughout the year. So be on the lookout for them as well. So next, uh, we're going to talk about the say stink bug. This one can often be confused with the last one that we talked about, the conchuela bug. Uh, this is Chlorocroa say, so this is in the same uh, genus as the Conchuela bug. So this one also has a really dense border on it that's either pale white or sometimes it's completely orange. Uh, but the one difference with this one is that uh, they have all these really dense white spots on the convexium here. So again, the convexium is sort of this wing area that goes down into the membrane, but it has this really uh, hard sclerotized part uh, that is definitely densely spotted. Uh, and also, this one also has a green morph, so just only has a green morph, excuse me. So just keep that in mind as well. Uh, so use the solid coloration and then these densely packed white spots to identify the Say's stink bug. Uh, 
Uh, in addition, this one is also an occasional fruit and vegetable crop pest. We kind of see this one to the same extent that we see the Conchuelo bug. Uh, we find it pretty much throughout the season, uh, but we don't really see high infestations of them or them causing heavy amounts of damage. So next, uh, this is a pretty, a very common one, I would say, especially once we get closer into the vegetable crops. Uh, this one's called the red-shouldered stink bug, and that name can uh, sometimes be kind of challenging to identify because even though it's called a red-shouldered stink bug, not all of them have, rev have red shoulders. <laughs> so this one is solid green, sort of like uh, the green stink bug that we talked about first, uh, but this one is a lot smaller. This one only probably gets to about uh, I mean, a little bit less than a half inch, whereas the green stink bug is typically a half inch or larger. But if you look close enough, you can often find these little red shoulders here, uh, or what is typically common in the species, you get a nice really uh, dark pink or red band that goes across the, the top, or again, that's called the pronotum up here. So keep an eye out for that, uh, but that is typically solid green and much smaller. Just sort of keep that in mind. And, this is unfortunately one of the ones that the nymph looks completely unlike the adult for pretty much all the life stages. Uh, the eggs for these are typically gray in color. Sometimes they'll have little circle patterns on the tops of them. Uh, but the eggs of this one are really hard to find because they're a little bit smaller. So again, this one is really common. We see this year round and we see them in fairly high abundances in many different crops, whether it be fruit or vegetable. Uh, but again, they don't really cause a lot of damage from what we've seen especially long-term damage or something that we would consider economic. So then we'll talk about, this is probably one of the most common stink bugs that we see in the Mountain West. This is the one-spotted stink bug or Eushistus variolarius. Uh, this is a larger stink bug that's pretty much solid brown. It has some black modeling or black spots on it. And it's typically a lot lighter underneath here than it is on the top. Okay, so again, this is a, one of the most common ones that we see. Again, we'll talk about shortly that we don't really think that this one's going to cause any economic concerns, but it is very common. And it's quite often that you'll find these in your, in your field or in your home garden and things like that. Uh, so just keep that in mind that it's solid brown. And we're gonna talk about one more solid brown one here momentarily uh, that looks really similar. And I'll show you how to uh, keep those two apart or separate those two when identifying them. Uh, this one is a really small stink bug that does not have a common name. Uh, this one is probably the least common out of all of the ones that I've shared with you all, uh, but it is still moderately common depending on your exact location and what kind of crops are growing. Uh, so this is a really small stink bug that is mottled brown in color. This one is probably only a quarter inch in size. So very tiny and they often have these, uh, this really dense or dark or bright, I guess you could say white spot uh, on, their, on their body. Uh, this one, another way you can identify it is from the top, they tend to be really dark, whereas their legs are a lot lighter in color. Uh, again, you probably shouldn't expect to see a ton of these, but we do bring it up because it is model brown. And we'll be talking about uh, an invasive one, the brown martin-rated stink bug next, uh, that is also model brown, but you'll definitely want to separate the two. And I always bring this up too, this is really fun. When stink bug eggs are getting ready to hatch, they often form these like little tiny smiley faces, which is really fun. Uh, so keep an eye out for that too. If you ever do find stink bug eggs, uh, they often have these really cool shapes on them when they're about to hatch, which is just kind of a fun thing to look at. So this one is sort of the, the topic of discussion today, the brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, this is Haleomorpha halis, or we call it BMSB for short. So this is another mottled brown stink bug. This one is about a half inch in size, uh, and it is extremely common and mostly locally abundant. So this is an invasive species that many of us uh, on here have probably heard of at some point. Uh, maybe some of us have had to manage for them before. Uh, but the way we tell this one apart from a lot of the lookalikes is we look at the antenna. So the antenna on the brown marmorated stink bug have two little white stripes on them. And they're typically easy to see if you're out in the field and you have sunlight shining on them or some sort of light, for, uh, light source. Uh, but they're about a half inch. They have these white stripes on the side like uh, you can see here and they have the white stripes on the antenna. So if you see the white stripes on a brown colored stink bug that's sort of mottled and has these little speckles on them, odds are you're looking at a brown marmorated stink bug. And this is when we start to get concerned because it is an invasive from uh, Eastern Asia that feeds on over 170 crops and plants 
uh, in the United States and in North America, both ornamental and uh, you know, crops. So this is the one that we're going to formulate a lot of this talk on, and I'll be going through a little bit of the research that I've personally done on brown marmorated stink bug, uh, just to help you guide your uh, monitoring decisions and your management decisions, even if you're commercial or if you are in just a, you're a home gardener. So before I move on to the research side of things, uh, we do have a common stink bug fact sheet that explains some of the other stink bugs that we see in Utah, but this also can translate to other regions in the Mountain West. Uh, so if you're tuning in from another state, a lot of the stink bugs in this fact sheet are going to be the same. Uh, this one also, or this fact sheet also describes a lot of the beneficial species. We do have those, again, predatory stink bugs that are in agricultural sites that are actually helping to control uh, pest species. So this is just on our Utah Pest website. You can find, or you can even just search the internet for common stink bugs of Utah. And this fact sheet will pop right up that has a ton of pictures. It has pictures of nymphs, has really good identification resources on there. So I really recommend you check that out. And there'll be some also information that we've already discussed here during the webinar. So we look at some of the damage that stink, stink bugs cause. It really can depend on when uh, the stink bugs are feeding on the plant. So again, we have this proboscis here that is sticking right into the plant. And when it pulls it out, it's obviously leaving a hole in the fruit that different pathogens can get into. And also you're, they're excreting digestive enzymes that can change the physiology of the fruit and how that fruit is developing. So if you feed on, or if a stink bug feeds on sort of an earlier season, or it feeds on a fruit or any crop sort of earlier in the season before that fruit or vegetable has time to develop, we see a couple of different things. We see some of this gamosis here. So we see this gel-like structure coming out of the fruit. Uh, this is a sign that something stuck its proboscis into the fruit and pulled the proboscis out. And then we see this cat phasing damage where this peach here is just really deformed. Uh, this is characteristic of a stink bug feeding er earlier in the season. So after the petals fall off the flower, once that fruit starts to develop, uh, we can see this cat phasing damage. If they feed later in the season, we can start to see the dimpling uh, structures forming on these fruits. And if you cut that open, or if this damage has enough time to develop or is really heavy, we start to get this corking damage. So if you were to cut this apple open, uh, you would see all these little corks, uh, corking areas inside that fruit. And certainly uh, this fruit would be unmarketable, right? And then with tomatoes, so this is like a really soft fruit or, or vegetable. Uh, we see similar symptoms on here. We have all these little necrotic areas where if you were to cut that open, it would just be really gross, right? So this is characteristically what we see uh, with sink bug feeding pretty much uniformly. So we discussed all these different species of stink bugs, but only some of them are actually going to require management. And because we have such a, a broad audience here today, I'm going to be sort of discussing monitoring and management in larger practices and then smaller practices or home gardeners as well. So if you're in a commercial practice or something that's large scale, uh, really only BMSB is expected to reach those economic injury levels. Uh, that is because it is invasive, it's locally abundant. We don't have a lot of uh, beneficial species that are actively trying to control them and to keep them in check. Uh, whereas if you're in a small practice, then maybe some of these other stink bugs can be more of a problem. So you want to be actively monitoring for them uh, and you know, checking for them to make sure that there's none that are just becoming overwhelming to your crops. So how do we monitor for these stink bugs? Uh, you can choose many different methods and it'll probably depend on your, your specific situation and what you're growing and how big your, your land is. Uh, but there are a couple really good methods uh, and some that are more effective for smaller practices. So uh, we have different types of traps, which are a really good monitoring tool that's passive. So we essentially have these little BMSB dual lures. These are purchased from Trace Incorporated. And these are placed on different styles of stink bug traps to essentially attract uh, brown, mostly brown marmorated stink bug. But I will say that these are also effective for many of the native stink bugs as well. And you place that lure either on this ag bio pyramid trap. So this is one that is thought to mimic the base of a tree and stink bugs really like tree trunks. So if you place that little pheromone lure on, you kind of hang it under this little collection cup at the top, uh, BMSB will just kind of crawl into it, fly onto the trap and crawl into the cup. It's a really good way to manage for BMSB. 
Uh, the other way that is recommended in a large uh, proportion of the country is this trace dual panel sticky trap. Uh, so the sticky trap is much more cost effective because it's just a wooden stake in the ground with a little dual sided sticky panel on it. And again, you place the pheromone there, it'll attract the stink bugs to the trap and then you just collect them and can count them and monitor them that way. Uh, so this again is recommended pretty much throughout the United States, but I'll talk a little bit about one of the research projects I did and how in the Mountain West, especially Utah, which is what we can really speak to, uh, we might still be recommending the pyramid trap as of right now, and I'll discuss that later on. So we also have uh, hand sampling methods. Uh, we have this beat sheet sampling method here. So this little sheet right here is a canvas sheet that you can hold under uh, host plant leaves or branches and things like that. And you're, we're using a little stick here to essentially agitate the vegetation. And stink bugs, like many insects, if you agitate the vegetation that they're in, the stink bug is just, or whatever insect it is, is going to just fall straight down. And in this particular case, it'll fall onto the sheet. Uh, so this is a really easy and cheap way to monitor for stink bugs. And I can give some recommendations later on here too about when we think bead sheet sampling might be the best recommendation versus when we think uh, pyramid traps or sticky panel traps might be effective. Uh, hand sampling is definitely the most cost effective way to monitor for stink bugs. Uh, because all it requires is to go out with a little stick and a little sheet. It can even be something DIY that you do at your home or residence, uh, and you can just monitor for them. But this, again, is active. It takes more time, but it is really cost effective. And if you're in some sort of small practice or you're just a home gardener, just checking by hand is the best way to monitor for stink bugs. So you can look at the plants, uh, or you can just check the leaves for egg masses or different life stages. So if you're doing it by hand, if you don't have a trap or if you don't have beet sheets or any sort of uh, materials to do that, we are just going to want to look at things. So stink bugs all like to lay their eggs on the undersides of leaves. I've seen them lay eggs on the top of leaves a few times, but most of the time they're gonna lay them underneath. And stink bug egg masses are always laid in these clusters. They average from about 14 eggs in an egg mass to sometimes over 50. Uh, but the average is probably about 28 egg mass or eggs per egg mass and brown marmorated stink bug uh, lays about 28 eggs okay but if you uh, have adults or if you want to check for nymphs and adults you're going to want to check all of the structures on the plant you're going to want to look at the flowers you're going to want to look at the fruits pretty much all the life stages of the plants to check for these adults or nymphs that are crawling around on the plant uh, stink bugs especially bmsb will feed on the leaves, they'll feed on buds, flowers, they'll feed on fruits, they'll pretty much feed on every structure on the plant. Uh, odds are, if you have some sort of fruiting structure, they will be feeding actively on that, but definitely look under the leaves for the egg masses. Uh, they like to lay their eggs here because underneath them, the leaf protects them from the elements, uh, and then check every single fruiting or every single structure on the plant for the crawling nymphs and the crawling adults. So again, we're gonna focus a lot of this webinar here on BMSB because it is the only one that we expect to see major problems with. Uh, so this here is a map of the BMSB invasion in the United States. If you're tuning in from Nevada and Montana or Idaho, Wyoming, you're in luck uh, because we don't really see a lot of agricultural issues from BMSB in those areas yet, but it's still good to keep an eye out uh, for them. So in these red areas here, and I apologize if you're red, green, colorblind, this can kind of be tough to uh, to understand, so I'll just describe it, where most of our severe agricultural problems are in the mid-Atlantic here, which is where I'm from, and I actually used to study this pest in Delaware. Uh, and we're starting to see some issues kind of uh, peak up here in the, the Pacific Northwest and in the West as well. And in Utah, we were just, we had detections pretty much uh, early on, and we just found agricultural damage back in 2017, and the issues here seem to be either stable or getting a little bit worse. So. Uh, this will be really applicable for those of you in Utah, uh, but if you're in Nevada or Montana, you definitely want to keep an eye out for a brown marmorated stink bug in case it arrives or in case the issues get worse. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the research projects that I've done uh, that can help guide your management decisions or your monitoring decisions, whether you're a commercial grower or whether you're just a, garden, a gardener, okay? So in the East where I used to do research, uh, it's really commonly understood that BMSB typically exhibits some sort of field edge effect. Uh, 
Uh, so if you have a really large plot of land that you're growing or you have an orchard or any sort of crop field, BMSB is really going to enjoy the edges. Uh, so just think maybe the first three to four rows uh, in within those big orchards. Uh, but landscape can really impact the severity of pests. So if we look at other invaded regions, and this is a, just a screenshot from Google Earth uh, of one of the orchards that I used to do some BMSB research in uh, on the right here. And we can see that the landscape on the right is a lot different than what we experience in Utah. And this is on the left is probably similar to what you're seeing in Nevada and Montana. Where in the east, we have huge expanses of forest, several acres of forest. And then we have really large agricultural fields that have, you know, different crops are being grown in there, certainly. Uh, so this can actually really impact uh, the severity of pests, including BMSB. So we think, or at least a lot of the research suggests, that because there are wooded resources nearby, it allows the stink bugs to move between the two sources pretty much throughout the whole year. So they can be feeding on some of the trees, because remember they feed on a lot of different native ornamental trees. Uh, they can go between there, fly into the orchard or crop field, feed on those plants, and kind of go back and forth. Uh, so maybe that's why they only like to feed on the first few rows of crops, because they like to go in and out you know, pretty much throughout the whole year. But if we look at Utah, we've seen most of our BMSB invasion and populations in these really small agricultural sites that are more or less surrounded by urbanization. So this is one of the, just a, a, a screenshot of, again, from Google Earth, uh, from a bird's eye view of this one research site that I did some of my research in. And you can see here that this is surrounded by development. We have uh, just homes that are built on every single side of this orchard here. So this could really impact how BMSB is you know, invading these areas, how much they're going to cause damage. Uh, are we going to see a lot of the damage and feeding on the edge? Or maybe because you know, this field site is smaller, maybe there isn't going to be an edge effect in the Mountain West or in Utah in these smaller agricultural sites. So this is what I aim to figure out. You know, are we seeing these edge effects in these smaller agricultural sites in the Mountain West? And again, BMSB can be a threat to larger sites as well, but a lot of the issues that we're seeing, especially in Utah here, are in these smaller sites. So I set up this little experiment, and I'll, I'll keep this uh, brief here, but where we set up those two different types of traps that I discussed earlier, where we have these pyramid traps indicated by these blue stars, and then sticky traps indicated by these green circles. And we had different locations within agricultural sites that we set up the traps. So we set up a pair of a sticky trap and a pyramid trap, and we placed them on the exterior of the agricultural site. We then placed a pair of traps uh, between the first two rows of trees, which we're calling a border trap or a border location. We went interior to the, uh, that, that last pair of traps here, and we're calling that the border interior. And then we placed a pair of traps at the center of the orchard as well. And then we just repeated this on the opposite side of the orchard. So we're kind of getting two replications out of one field site here. So every week we would go out into this field and we would just count all the BMSB adults and nymphs in these different traps. Uh, and then to do some hand sampling as well, we sampled the vegetation surrounding each trap uh, for about two minutes, just to see you know, how the traps were doing in comparison to uh, how we were doing with hand sampling. And this was really interesting in one of my field sites. Uh, this is a pyramid trap. We actually had black widow spiders that would web in the collection cup uh, or underneath the collection cup and they would capture all of my stink bugs before they made it in uh, to the collection cup. So I don't know if it's better to die via black widow spider or if it's better to crawl in and hit the pesticide mesh. I'm not sure, but that was a really interesting find and this uh, black widow spider is still on my desk at work and it survived from last year. So that's pretty cool. Uh, but the, this is typically what will happen with the pyramid traps is we'll get the BMSB. This is a little insect right here that was just captured. And this looks like a stink bug right here. So they'll crawl in and essentially just get stuck in the trap. And they have a little piece of pesticide mesh in there or insecticide mesh uh, that will dispatch them. Uh, this is what a sticky trap collection will look like. We just have a bunch of stink bugs that are just stuck to the sticky trap. And there's quite a few of them on this particular trap. And there's probably, I think there were six of them, six or seven the last time I counted, because I think there's a couple that are kind of hidden. Uh, and this is probably the most or the highest number of stink bugs that we ever collected on a sticky panel trap. Uh, and I'll talk about more of that uh, shortly when I talk about some of the results from this study. Uh, 
Uh, and then this, is, this was done in an ornamental location just in the middle of Salt Lake City. Uh, but we would capture stink bugs on occasion with these bead sheet samples as well. So to do this analysis, we combined stink bug catch or BMS bee catch over three different seasonal periods. Uh, this is really important to take into account. Uh, so we just divided it into early season, mid season, and late season. These are seven to eight weeks, uh, seven to eight week periods. Okay, and it's important to note too that we did this research in vastly different types of agricultural sites. We did it in some fruit orchards. We did it in some small vegetable plots. Uh, so this information can apply to you whether you're in a larger commercial practice or a sort of a smaller home gardening practice. So here we have uh, the number of BMSB captured in those three seasonal periods. So we're combining all the traps into these three seasonal periods. We have the pyramid trap captures in blue, the sticky trap captures in green, and then the visual inspections, so the beet sheet samples here in gray. And what quickly pops out is that pyramid traps are a lot more effective typically than the other two sample methods. Uh, so we're getting sort of this driving force here that this pyramid trap gets more and more effective as you get into the later season. Uh, early season, everything is kind of sl slow. We're not really getting a lot of capture at all. I mean, only four BMSB per, uh, per trap, uh, but it's getting up until you know, 15, 16 BMSB per trap in the later season. Uh, so in all three of these seasonal periods, the early season, the mid season, and the late season here, the pyramid trap is always significantly more effective at capturing BMSB than sticky traps, uh, which is really interesting because remember we talked about earlier that they're typically recommending now, and when I say there, I mean scientists and the scientific community is recommending that you're monitoring for stink bugs with sticky traps now. Uh, so that is because Sticky traps, even though they don't capture as many BMSB, you're still able to monitor the populations of BMSB effectively. Uh, that might not be the case in Utah or in the Mountain West because the populations of BMSB aren't absolutely massive yet. So to me, and this was our, uh, we actually just had this paper accepted for publication. Uh, our recommendation is that, you know, even though sticky traps are generally recommended now, we're only getting one or two BMSB per trap. And that's really not quite enough BMSB per trap yet to effectively monitor for BMSB throughout the entire growing season. So keep that in mind. And then I'll also note too that uh, pyramid traps were also more effective at capturing BMSB than visual inspections in the mid and late season, but not in the early season. Uh, in the early season, just hand sampling is all that was needed to capture statistically the same number of BMSB. And then I guess the final note that I'll point out here too is that visual inspections aren't really more effective statistically than sticky panel traps. Uh, so keep that in mind as well. We might get as much usefulness in Utah out of hand sampling as you will with sticky traps. So then let's look at that location preference. And I think this is the most important thing that we'll be discussing today is, you know, where are BMSB preferring to be in these smaller agricultural sites that are really common, especially here in Utah? So interestingly, we found that BMSB didn't actually colonize in any specific area within orchards or within crop areas or cropping areas. So these are, this is essentially the, again, the mean number of BMSB captured. And this is among all these four locations within the field that we looked at. So the field exterior where again, there's no crops growing there. This is just to the outside of the growing area. Then we have these border locations uh, in between the first two trees in the row. We have border interior, 10 meters inside of the border, and then we have the center. And interestingly, if you look at all three of these locations here that are within the growing area, the number of BMSB that we captured in these locations was no different. They were not statistically different from one another. So we can say from this that BMSB don't seem to colonize within any specific area where crops are present. Again, this only applies to these smaller agricultural sites that we tested uh, whereas if you're in other regions of the U.S. where the invasion is really bad and the infestations are heavy and the, you know, the, the fields are a lot larger, we're seeing a huge border effect, but not here in Utah. So if you have, if you have smaller agricultural sites uh, or you're surrounded by urbanized areas, you probably don't want to monitor for stink bugs or for BMSB you know, just on the edge. It might be beneficial to monitor for them uh, throughout the whole site. And if you're a home gardener, if you just have a really small practice, you're definitely going to want to look at the entire agricultural site. 
So every site, and just to give some, some clarification or reference here, every site that we used was under six acres in size. So that's about two and a half hectares. Uh, so if you have something in that size range, perhaps you don't want to focus on the edge, which is where a lot of other growers throughout the country have to or you know, prefer to do their monitoring. Uh, we would recommend that if you're a commercial producer to use this pyramid trap because they do get the most number of stink bugs or BMSB with our really low populations that we still have. If the populations of BMSB increase, it's possible we could start moving towards uh, the sticky panel traps. And then again, we really want to recommend to use beach heat sampling or even hand detection uh, for stink bugs, especially if it's early in the season, because early in the season, every single trap type statistically was just as effective as the others. Uh, so this is more, again, for commercial production. If you're in a, a home garden or something like that, you'll probably want to focus on hand sampling, just checking all of your, all your uh, crops for stink bug nymphs and adults and eggs throughout the season uh, because it is the most cost effective. And in a home garden, that is probably all that's needed to prevent a lot of really serious damage. And this is the, essentially the next or the, one of the other research projects that I took part in here at Utah State when I was a grad student. And we'll just kind of summarize it in that late season crops are possibly more at risk, especially in the Mountain West. So these are Utah averages here for precipitation and then low temperatures in the dark blue line and average high temperatures in the, uh, in the red line here. And if you're from Utah or anywhere in the Mountain West, you're probably familiar with how much the temperature can fluctuate uh, between nighttime and daytime and how dry it is, especially if you're tuning in from Utah and Nevada. Uh, where you know we have this really low precipitation, we have really warm daytime temperatures, and then it gets really cold at night. And if you're familiar with how insects function, they are ectotherms, they get a lot of their energy or really all of their uh, just energy from the sun, or at least that's the, uh, what their body temperature relates to. The insects are more active when it's warm out. So if we have these really cold or really cool nighttime temperatures, it's not gonna warm up until midday where as if you're in a really humid area, say the mid-Atlantic, it's gonna be really warm first thing in the morning. Uh, so this might change you know, how heavily BMSB are feeding on crops throughout the growing season. So in the Mountain West, we're expecting that maybe these temperature fluctuations have a lot to do uh, with when BMSB is going to be causing problems and when we'll really need to look at monitoring and managing our crops here. And I'll use tart cherry as an example. I'm sure there are uh, plenty of us on the call right now that are you know, growers of tart cherry, but it's just a really great example to explain uh, sort of that, that, uh, sort of that uh, question that we're bringing. You know, does it matter when BMSB is feeding? So tart cherry in Utah is harvested around mid-July. So mid-July is, we still have quite cool mornings. You know, maybe the day is really hot or the high temperature is really hot. But early in the day, it's still really cool. So BMSB might not be feeding really heavily uh, that early in the season, or at least enough to cause a lot of economic loss in this crop. So the question that we asked for this project was, how does BMSB feeding by adults or nymphs impact the quality and yield of tart cherry? And there are a lot of papers that say that, you know, the impact of a, a feeding stink bug will really depend on when feeding occurs. So if insects feed on the bud stage, uh, we will see a lot different uh, damage symptoms than we see in, say, if they feed on the mid-green stage or on the mature fruit stage, right? So again, this, these stages of tar cherry happen really early in the year where there's really you know, not a ton of insect activity at all. Uh, whereas if you have a fruit, say, like peach or apple that is harvested later in the season, there's a lot more stages of that fruit that uh, the stink bugs will have the opportunity to feed on and cause damage. So that's really what we're looking at here. Uh, so I'll go through some of this stuff relatively quickly, uh, just because it's really intricate. Uh, but we essentially tested to see if adult stink bugs, nymph stink bugs, and how they're in impacting the growth and the quality and the yield of crops. Then we also had a control treatment where we just saw what the fruits did without any stink bug exposure. And then we measured uh, their feeding intensity, so how heavily the stink bugs are feeding or how often. Uh, the stink bugs are feeding on these different, uh, on the cherries, uh, the marketability that we just put through a laser sorting machine, and then the quality of the fruit. So, you know, what is its mass? What is its diameter? Is it impacted by adults feeding on it, nymphs feeding on it, etc.? And then just really quickly, our experimental design, we just had a row of tart cherry trees that we bagged or we put mesh bags around the branches 
and we exposed the nymph treatment or the adult treatment or the control treatment to these bags and we allowed the stink bugs to feed. So this is kind of what our orchard looked like here. Just a bunch of bags filled with stink bugs or uh, nothing in the case of the controls. So this was a really interesting and fun experiment and it actually told us a lot. And again, one of the, the most important things about this project is we wanted to see how BMSB was going to impact tart cherry if they fed on different developmental stages of the fruit. So we initiated treatments uh, at each one of these development stages we can see here on the screen. We started at the bud stage and we went all the way through to the mature fruit stage. And we allowed feeding to occur for one week and then we took out the bugs and half of the fruits and I'll discuss why we did that momentarily. Uh, so to measure feeding intensity, uh, we essentially just harvested those fruits, that, that first half of fruits, as soon as we took the bugs out. And we stayed them with this little acid fusion stain and then it's really easy to just count the feeding structures, which this is uh, called a stylet sheath. And we just essentially counted the number of times the stink bugs fed on those fruits. And I'll just point out some stuff really quickly here. Uh, so we found a couple of really main point or main key things here where throughout the growing season, as it got warmer, uh, stink bugs fed on the fruits more heavily. That can be expected. Uh, it's warmer outside, the stink bugs are more active for you know, longer periods during the day. Uh, so early in the season, pretty much from the bud stage to the first blush, we don't really see a lot of feeding at all. And that was characteristic in both years. So 2018 here is on the top. When we tested it in 2019, that's here on the bottom. Uh, so the same general trends are there. Uh, adults, again, are in blue, nymphs are in green, and controls are in gray. And adults fed more heavily than nymphs. Uh, and then certainly the controls really had no feeding on them at all, which is what we expected. So our experiment worked in that regard. So again, I'll go through some of the stuff relatively quickly to get to the main point here, uh, where those fruits that we left in the bags, we harvested them at the typical harvest time, and then we assessed marketability and quality. So we measured mass, diameter, and then the sugar content of these tart cherries. So this is really busy, so I've highlighted a lot of the parts that we want to focus on here in blue, uh, where we see, we don't really see a lot happening. So this is essentially the proportion of fruits that are marketable here on the y-axis. And we can see that there's not really a ton going on. You know, a lot of the adult numbers match closely to what the nymph and control numbers are uh, in many of the stages. Uh, but if you go to this first blush stage, we can see that none of the fruits in the first blush stage were marketable if they were fed on by adults or nymphs. And recall from the, one of the previous slides that the first blush stage, there really wasn't a lot of BMSB feeding going on. Um, and then once we get past this pit hardening stage in both years, uh, a lot of the mar fruits are marketable again, which was really interesting. Uh, and again, in 2019, where we tested more life stages, which I, I didn't mention earlier, but we tested more stages in 2019. Uh, again, in these stages prior to pit hardening here, we have really low levels of BMSB feeding, but we have really high a uh, loss of marketability if adults or nymphs feed on them. And the reason that that is, is because feeding uh, induced fruit abscission. So these are fruits that essentially look like this, the fruit completely abscised from the tree. And even in these stages where there's very little BMSB feeding, all of the fruits or many of the fruits uh, just completely abscised from the tree. So I mean, this is a very interesting thing and we, it matches up closely to what other research has shown that if BMSB feeds on earlier season uh, stages of fruits that you're more likely to experience abscission and quality and or marketability loss. But if we actually look at marketability of the fruits, we didn't actually find quality differences that are statistically significant uh, from the diameter, mass, and sugar content standpoint. Uh, we only found two, and these, you know, even though that, you know, say in the, the diameter here in the mid-green stage, uh, control fruits were a little bit heavier or larger than nymph-fed fruits, you know, even these nymph-fed fruits here, they're still a marketable fruit. So this isn't something that would prevent that fruit from being sold, uh, whereas, and we, again, we look at mass, uh, where the control fruits were a little bit heavier than adult fed fruits, but this fruit is still marketable, right? So this is a really important consideration that, you know, if BMSB feeds on these fruits in the early season, uh, you could lose marketability, but are BMSB truly in agricultural sites in these areas where it's really cold at night, pretty much up until July, you know, are we going to be experiencing problems? Uh, and the answer to that is probably not. 
uh, because we harvest cherries or tart cherries at least so early in the season, they can probably prevent a lot of BMSB damage or especially uh, marketability loss or fruit abscission uh, just because of the climate here in Utah. So this is something to really consider depending on what crops you grow. If you have earlier season crops, we might not have to worry about BMSB too much in the Mountain West. Whereas if you're growing things that are late in season crops like peaches, apples, maybe we have to worry about BMSB a little bit more. Uh, and for tar cherries, I'll just mention too, uh, quality differences, they were pretty minimal. Uh, so you know, even if BMSB feeds more heavily later in the season, we probably harvest tart cherries early enough that BMSB is never really going to cause issues. And this also plays a role in the fact that tart cherry is a processed crop, so you don't really buy them fresh, but uh, that is sort of another research you know, topic that we could also talk about later. So I'll talk about management really quickly here. So I'll mention that BMSB is resistant to many insecticides. Uh, so this is a problem um, in, in the fact that most insecticides are for commercial control and you're spraying broad spectrum insecticides like neonicotinoids, carbamates, and pyrethroids. And you have to spray them often and you have to spray them heavily, typically. Uh, this is because BMSB can avoid a lot of sprayed on pesticides or insecticides because they stick their proboscis into the actual fruits and fruiting structures. Uh, so if you are a commercial producer, you will be looking at broad spectrum insecticides primarily uh, if you end up reaching economic injury levels. Uh, but for home gardeners, because a lot of these insecticides are for commercial control, you're going to want to focus on just scouting for these insects, removing the egg masses, nymphs and adults when you see them, and just checking for the egg masses regularly. And anyone can promote biological control agents, which I'll talk about momentarily. So just to uh, finish up with this, because we all grow different crops and we're all in different locations, I'll point you to some really great resources here. So this is stopemsb.org. This is the home page, and you can click on this beautiful little management tab here, and it will essentially take you to uh, managing BMSB, where you can look at information for management by crop, uh, different chemical controls. It's really a useful resource, and I recommend you check it out if you happen to have stink bugs that you're concerned about, especially BMSB. Uh, and you can download integrated pest management uh, tools just by, by crop here, where you can look at grapes, orchard crops, there's one in here for vegetable crops, et cetera. And it gives you really great lists of the different chemicals that are used, the uh, pre-harvest interval for spraying uh, in days. And I'll just mention here too, that you really want to read and understand and follow the labels because uh, every state has different regulations. So you want to make sure that the chemical that you select is registered for use on your specific crop in your specific state. Uh, but definitely use Stop BMSB for a lot of that information. It's a really great resource for control recommendations. If you're a home practice or you're uh, in a practice that can sort of take these cultural control methods easily, uh, row covers over your crops are really beneficial because stink bugs, and I'm not sure what these bugs here are in the corner, uh, but they prevent the bugs from getting to your crops. Uh, you can cover your you know, fruit tree branches in mesh bags, sort of like we did for that feeding experiment. And then one of the really important ones is don't plant catalpa. Uh, catalpa is an ornamental tree species that is grown for its really large leaves, its beautiful flowers, and it has these really cool bean pods on them if you've never seen one. And interestingly, most of the sites where we found a really heavy infestations of BMSB, there was always a catalpa nearby. Uh, and this is the ornamental host that we find BMSB on the most often in the state of Utah. And if BMSB does get worse in uh, those of you tuning in from other states, it's probably gonna start on Catalpa. We think the invasion really started and exploded in the state of Utah because Catalpa was available for them. So if you have a Catalpa and you're experiencing a lot of stink bug problems, um, maybe this is something that you can, can take care of. And one thing that I didn't mention is that BMSB likes to overwinter inside our human structures. Uh, so if you have a house that is a really good overwintering site for them, they're going to overwinter in there, go right outside and feed right on that catalpa tree that you have in your yard. Uh, and then they can go from there and spread it into the agricultural site. So if you have catalpa or if you're thinking of planting one, it's probably good to not plant it if you're worried about BMSB. Uh, or if you have one that's easily removed or transplanted somewhere far away, uh, maybe that's a good decision as well. But it's always good to monitor for BMSB to see if uh, they're an issue first before you go, you know, just removing these really big trees. And I'll sort of finish up with this. Uh, you know, what do we do for long-term management? So, you know, insecticides, I mentioned briefly that uh, 
they are they usually have to be sprayed at high frequency uh, and this is expensive so the control of bmsb has focused on biological control using these little parasitoid wasps so parasitoid wasps these are really tiny so if we're looking at this one right here you know, stink bug eggs are pretty small so these wasps are only one to three millimeters long and they essentially fly around and they sting the stink bug eggs and they'll lay their own egg inside the stink bug egg. When I refer to stinging, I, I really mean that they're laying their egg inside the stink bug egg. Uh, the wasp will then feed uh, on the stink bug. And I just got a question and I'll uh, go to that in just one moment here. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, so they, the, oops, sorry. So the wasp will essentially feed on the developing stink bug as the wasp develops. And then a wasp will eventually emerge from that egg instead of a stink bug. So this is a very interesting and it's a project that the really researchers throughout the country have been working on for a very long time. Uh, and we just found this really interesting wasp called the samurai wasp here in Utah in 2019, which is actually native to Eastern Asia, which is the same place that brown marmorated stink bug is from. Uh, so this is a parasitoid wasp that is very effective at parasitizing BMSB eggs. And we expect it to be really good at controlling BMSB in the mountain west. And we have a new researcher, a new graduate student here at Utah State University. It's going to do some research on focusing on how we can provide resources to really promote this biological control agent. Because if this wasp becomes widespread, maybe BMSB will never be a huge concern in the Mountain West. And if you are tuning in from Nevada or Montana or another state, uh, we probably won't experience this wasp until the stink bug arrives and establishes. So if you're tuning in from another state other than Utah, you might not have to uh, worry about this just quite yet, uh, but this wasp is a friend. So if you see any little black dots that are on uh, stink bug eggs when you find them, it's definitely a type of parasitoid wasp and hopefully it will be the samurai wasp. Uh, so this is sort of a work in progress here in uh, Utah, but other states are also already releasing the samurai wasp that they found uh, months or even years ago. So uh, this is sort of where the project is heading. And hopefully this little wasp will establish and help us with our crops. So uh, with that, I, I only saw this one question pop up here in the chat, which I will get to. But if you have any questions, feel free to type them in. Uh, we have a few minutes still left over. And then the question that was asked, if you don't have the chat pulled up, is, is there a fruit they prefer over another, such as cherry or apple? Uh, there has been a, some research that's been done on this. Uh, really, unless you have sort of a polyculture where you're growing different crops, uh, they will feed on pretty much anything, and it probably depends on where the source is coming from. So let's say you have an orchard where you have cherry trees and then you have apple trees. Uh, if one of those are closer to, say, the, the urbanized area of the landscape, say the, the houses or, you know, what have you, uh, odds are they'll probably just enjoy the first crop that they find. Um, I don't know of any, and if I do, I'm not recalling it off the top of my head, that there's been specific tests done to you know, give them an apple and give them a cherry and see which one they prefer. Uh, that's a very good question in that regard. But if you have a polyculture where things are all mixed in, if you have these smaller agricultural sites, they'll probably be feeding on everything. Or if you have something larger, they'll probably just be on the crops that are closer to where the source of the population came from, say on the houses or the ornamental trees. 